Yeah. So you can introduce first and then... Thanks a lot, Marco. So I think this is what we might call a wake-up call. And this is also how I got to know Marco, who also gave us a wake-up call to say, we're, I mean, Florian is working for at uh, LMU Munich, and he also has his two of his own companies working in remote sensing. Margaret and I, we're professors in economics and on biodiversity. We work at the University of Bern, but we also work at an institution that aims to turn science into practice. And Marco was also challenging us and saying, hey, is what you do actually efficient? How can you, a scientist, really achieve impact in the real world? And that's how our whole collaboration started and where we saw, yes, this is something that could work. There is a lot of potential. But we also said, you saw it. I mean, it's a complex world. It's a complex alliance. So we need to show this works on a concrete project in a concrete landscape. And this is where Margaret will get started and tell you what we plan to do as a first, there will be more today, first Nature, nature Data Alliance pilot project. Thank you, Kai. So we are all reminded today in most of the presentations we have listened to that we have no time. The time is now. So I'd like to welcome you on a journey to Kenya and specifically, okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So this is where we are working in Northern Kenya, a place known as Laikipia, where we have multiple users of this beautiful landscape. We have private conservancies trying to protect wildlife. We have pastoralists trying to find a living for their livestock. We have the beautiful savannas. And I will now zoom in a little bit just to show you how beautiful the landscapes are. No? Okay, yes, this is where we should be. So if you zoom in a little bit, you'll see the beautiful savannas, the beautiful wildlife, the forest and the bushes, and the wetlands, amongst others. So this beautiful landscape is what underpins the functionality of this system in terms of the ecosystem services that we get. And one of the important ecosystem services that we get from this beautiful landscape is carbon sequestration, which is what underpins what we are all talking about, carbon uh, CO2 regulation, CO2 sequestration. So how do we manage this if this landscape is threatened by the different land users, different actors that I've just highlighted before? So then therefore, there's need for us to come together, work together, and ensure that these beautiful systems are protected coming from uh, Biodiversity background, biodiversity here is highly threatened. This is the region where we have the gravest zebra, we have the elephants, and many other um, components of biodiversity, which are really in danger. One of the experiences we have is this. Oh, it's just not showing. I think they was before. This is human wildlife conflict. How do we address this? It has been ongoing for so many years now. There are systemic problems with it, but then there's need to come together to address this, to reduce this kind of pressures. Hence, the need for us to have good and up-to-date data, continuous monitoring of biodiversity, checking where the wildlife corridors are, because people have moved into wildlife corridors. So how do we work towards this? And that's why we have Florian, an expert, <laughs> in GIS, remote sensing, to help us gather this data. Welcome, Floria. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so looking at this picture, you see uh, there are manifold connections between wildlife as, and pastoralists, uh, between pastoralists and forests, between smallholder agriculture and wild animals. So these are really complex processes. Um, which we do not yet fully understand because we do not have enough data. 
And that's uh, why uh, we are here. So our contribution to the project is to establish a digital uh, twin. And the role of the digital twin will be to monitor carbon, to monitor biodiversity, and to monitor uh, human economy. Uh, we will use a combination of uh, satellites and a new airplane, a solar-powered aircraft, which is capable in flying uh, more than two weeks uh, over the project area. And we will mount special sensors on this aircraft uh, to measure land cover, biomass, and to get a three-dimensional representation of the whole landscape. And the satellites will be used uh, to monitor fire, drought, rainfall, and uh, land degradation. So if you look at the images uh, taken by the uh, airplane in the middle, you see a lot of uh, detail, 20 centimeter resolution. They are so clear uh, that you can recognize uh, single trees and even tiny bushes and a lot of spatial detail, which is not visible in conventional satellite imagery. But most importantly, we will uh, mount uh, a sensor, a LiDAR instrument on this aircraft, which uh, will allow us to scan the vegetation in three dimensions. This is video. Yeah. So from this aerial imagery alone, you wouldn't uh, be able to ass assess biomass. Uh, so, but the LiDAR instrument uh, is capable in scanning through the forest, uh, giving us a three-dimensional representation of every tree, every bush in the ecosystem. And for that, for that we can determine the above-ground biomass and the carbon store in the forest. So two parameters are important. In that respect, uh, one is tree height we get from LiDAR, and single trees we identify in the aerial imagery, and we then determine the crown diameter and the tree height, and we can correlate this to field data of trees which have been measured in the field, and via allometry we can get uh, the data on biomass and carbon. Uh, and this, will, this technology will allow us to establish really a complete inventory of the total biomass in the ecosystem. So every tree, every bush, forests, grasslands will, will be scanned and assessed in um, the carbon content and of course so far as possible in terms of biodiversity. Um, and the data will allow us for the first time to, uh, to analyze the migration trails uh, of savanna animals and to even observe and monitor uh, larger savanna animals like elephants and ant antelopes. And they follow special migration patterns which are not fully understand, uh, understood. And also due to climate change, a lot is of change is happening in the ecosystem. And at the same time, pastoralists uh, follow the similar tracks um, with their livestock. And the conflicts, as we have seen in the first picture, uh, arise more and more frequent uh, in these, these days. So uh, we also will establish a complete inventory of all available water resources in, in the project area. So even tiny ponds in dried out streams will be uh, measured and detected and every water hole. So water availability is uh, very important and there's also a conflict or uh, competition uh, between livestock uh, animals and wild animals for this uh, important resource. And finally, we will uh, monitor fire occurrence, um, which uh, we find is increasing in this ecosystem due to climate change. So the savanna ecosystems are adapted to fire, but uh, due to human pressure and climate change, more frequent and more heavily burning fires occur. And we try to provide uh, better data for land, land use management. And we try to even in increase the carbon stores by uh, early burning technologies. And we will generate carbon credits uh, to be sold on the global market. And this will uh, finally generate revenues uh, for the local population. Because, of course, if they consider uh, the land management uh, recommendations, then they need some compensation uh, if they have, to, for example, to re reduce their livestock. So this was my part. And now, Kai. It says back and next. I hope I'm up for that challenge. So. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Marga. Thanks a lot, Florian. Quite amazing, the progress with regard to data, right? And really, this is not just incremental progress. This is really something that within 
an existing landscape will enable us to create more but also better projects and also use those data for further purposes like monitoring and rewarding people on the ground. But then again, it's also true, data is an enabler, it's a necessary condition for better projects, but it's not a sufficient condition. I mean, everyone who's worked in project management, or especially someone who's worked in a low-income context, knows data is not doing the trick alone. So one of our missions as at the VIS Academy, where us two and more are working, is to really say we need to take a systemic, holistic approach to solving these really wicked problems in such a landscape. So we need to take that better data, we need to use it to enable better monitoring, but we need to combine it with an interdisciplinary approach, taking really in the insights from different scientific disciplines. Then we, have, we need to be locally embedded, so together we are active in that region, not me personally, but our team, for almost three decades. So really have deep connections to local politics. We have a local team that will co-develop and co-design projects based on that better data. So in the end, we really hope to come up with solutions that have local ownership and that are also really tailored to the local context. Those participatory processes are important at various levels. First, really, when it comes to local and indigenous people. We need to secure local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, is included in the process, and we also need to secure that there are no potential conflicts evolving around the distribution of the revenues from the projects to really minimize the local project risk, because many projects are not failing for technical reasons, but for such more local distributional consequences. But of course, local people, that's one aspect. Politics can be an enabler. I know there are some people from politics here as well, but politics in such a context and generally can, of course, also be an obstacle. So we really need to make sure that such a participatory process also includes people from the local, gov from the local mayor level up to the regional governor to the national government, so they're all aligned. So this is where we also aim to use our really engagement in the region, our network in the region, to make sure local citizens, indigenous communities, but also politics is really included from the initial start of such a project. Now we have data, now we have processes, but there's of course also money. There's in the end the revenues that should flow to local and indigenous people. And let me say that's my scientific assessment. This is where the system is currently deeply flawed. I mean, first, it comes to how much money flows to local and indigenous communities. It's way too little. Some projects, it's less than 10%. We really need to use better technology, better monitoring, but also reduction in general costs to dramatically increase that share. Second, it's the delay of payments. I mean, many projects, until people on the ground receive their first revenue, it takes five years, eight years, 10 years. Now think about that. Soon it's New Year's. We'll all come up maybe with some resolutions, usually rather trivial, drink a little less, eat some bit less sweet stuff. Many of us will struggle to keep those rather trivial resolutions for even a month or two. But we expect a poor Kenyan farmer or a pastoralist to dramatically change their lifestyle in expectation of a payment that's coming in five, eight, or 10 years? That's not working out. And we now also have good scientific evidence from large-scale randomized control trials really showing that using upfront payments, or at least a certain share of upfront payments, can drastically increase project success. Third, we really need to smooth payments either only an upfront payment, but also only a payment at the end, that also won't be sufficient. We really need to ensure permanent revenue streams, permanent also jobs related to those revenue streams to the people on the ground to really secure local livelihoods. Using the better data that we have, and also not a one-time monitoring every year, will enable us to also reward certain behavior. So we aim, for instance, to create certain project success markers and then reward through micropayments, where research again has shown that even small micropayments, where you reward behavior if people acted in line with the project 
with the project aims also has a very positive effect on compliance with the project goals. Finally, money alone doesn't do the trick. I mean, we will work and many of the world's most precious natural assets are in regions where there's high illiteracy, people are very poor, which usually, of course, means they have a very short time horizon. We also need to combine those revenue streams with training, with monitoring. And the good news is, again, evidence from really large-scale randomized control trials, so not case studies, but really quantitative evidence, shows that if we combine revenues, stable, fair revenues, with additional training, we can, again, really improve project success and de-risk overall the project risk associated with the local level. How do we see us here? Well, I would say we see us as enablers. We want to help, we will help with the local processes, we will help with the scientific expertise, provide the better data and the monitoring options, but in the end, this is in, the, the aim of this whole, whole thing of the Nature Data Lines is to enable solutions so the more Data Alliance members, the more other members are joining us to make such a project work in a concrete landscape. So really showing this is not just an abstract, nice looking idea, but really something that can transform, that has a transformative impact on a concrete landscape. And then that evidence can be used to convince politicians, to convince governments that yes, this is an approach we can take and also scale up beyond that landscape. So we have a core project team that integrates us, but also further partners like CyberTracker to really integrate local people to con uh, like in addition to the satellites and the local to the and the planes to also include local people to collect further biodiversity data on the ground. We have further data partners. We use like acoustic sensors to collect further data. But of course, what we're also looking for is to have more partners to really develop this as a holistic project and bring in those solutions and also the financing part. And that's where I hand over to Marco again. Yeah,